Euromax highlights coming up on the show. Media sensation. Why advertising agencies are turning to amateur photographs. The great outdoors. The German city of Schwerin stages this year's national horticultural show. The perfect companion. Out and about with the wallpaper city guide. Euromax highlights. And here's your host, Robin Merrill. Hello and a very warm welcome from Berlin. April the 23rd was UNESCO World Book Day and with that in mind we begin with a visit to a rather picturesque town in France that has in recent years become known as the Town of Books. Two hours south of Paris in the Burgundy region is La Charité sur Loire and it has more than its fair share of bookshops. It all started just ten years ago when there was just the one bookseller but he had ambitions. La Charité sur Loire, a small medieval town on the Loire River with a magnificent church, picturesque narrow streets and an astonishing number of bookshops. Many of them are on the town's main street. Christian Valerio was the town's first bookshop owner. He returned to his hometown in 1992 after spending 25 years in Paris. When we came here between 1992 and 1999, the town was a little worse for wear and nothing was happening. So we thought we could change that by making La Charité sur Loire into a town of books. We thought the town was well suited to the idea. The mayor liked the idea too. I am generally open to new ideas, and I think it's good when citizens give input. Sometimes it works, sometimes not. But the book idea is really a huge success. I was enthusiastic from the beginning. The mayor asked Zenia Desfontaines to foster and market the project. Christian Valerio made use of his contacts to persuade people to open up second-hand bookshops in the town. Back then, 23 shops on this street were empty. Now, 12 bookshops have opened here, plus cafes, restaurants and souvenir shops. So this initiative has really revived the town. And thanks to this project, the local council has renovated the entire neighborhood, renewing the streets and the pavements. In the year 2000, La Charité sur Loire was officially named Town of Books. But along with bookshop owners, calligraphers and typographers were also attracted by the project. Carlos Sanchez Alamo is a bookbinder, and his wife, Els Baikenland, is a calligrapher. Both of them came here from Paris in the summer of 2008. Our professions have something in common. We all work with books. That's why we liked the idea. And we're not too far away from Paris. La Charité sur Loire regularly stages events linked to books. The trade fairs and festivals and the monthly book markets draw exhibitors and both domestic and foreign tourists. More than half of the town's 50,000 annual visitors come especially for the books. The atmosphere here can't be compared to that of surrounding communities. Even in larger town like Nevea, there isn't much going on. Our little town is very active. But in a way, La Charité sur Loire is the victim of its own success. These days, there are no more shops to let, even for people who want them. And rents have risen drastically. Understandable, really. After all, which bookworm wouldn't want to live here? From books to photography, which has changed immensely in recent years, mainly because of digital technology, but also because of the internet. Making a living as a professional photographer is very difficult because with the help of software, amateurs can make reasonable photos look much, much better. A new industry has emerged called micro-stock photography. We've been investigating. Micro-stock photographs are now part and parcel of the advertising industry. The 
three biggest providers have millions of photos in their archives, which are snapped up by marketing agencies, publishing houses, and newspapers for a fraction of standard commercial prices in the business. Most of the pictures, which sell for as little as 10 cents, are taken by amateurs. It was fascinating to see what these modern cameras are capable of. I just bought one and started taking pictures, originally just for myself. I took photos whenever I saw something interesting, sometimes when I was on holiday or traveling. But now his photos themselves travel the world. His pictures are featured in advertising campaigns, catalogs, and even on magazine covers. It's about conveying ideas. I think about what my customers need and what might be of interest, and what they're willing to spend money on. Arnett Hauptmann has his own assistant and books his own models. Together they develop the concept of each different shoot. Makeup is applied in the living room. On location, he checks the light, sets the mood. Everything must be just right. For the past two years, Trautmann, who was a lawyer, has spent his weekends taking photographs. He has 1,500 pictures in his archive, some of which have been bought over 3,000 times. By now, Arne Trautmann has learned what the agencies, publishing houses, and editors want. It shouldn't be too simple or too complicated, and it should be immediately apparent what the picture says. Hamburg-based Jung von Matt is considered one of the most creative advertising agencies in Germany. The team here also use microstock photos for their global campaigns. Susanna Nagel helps choose images. What are our options? Can we do the photography? Do we have enough money? Can we find it via a conventional picture agency or start a search? If time or money is limited, we use microstock. It can take days to choose photos for an advertising campaign. Often images are bought online as a backup or as a source of inspiration for other pictures. This here could be a flag which we buy via microstock. It's then combined with the other images as part of a collage. The advantage is obvious, which is why it's used so much. It's incredibly cheap. Regular agencies just can't compete. Microstock images aren't yet being used for major campaigns. The quality is simply not good enough. But the amateurs are improving, and professional equipment is more affordable than ever before. Pictures are edited on the computer and then uploaded to the Microstock Agency website. They have to be accompanied by a detailed description, which helps buyers to find the right photo as quickly as possible, before the image eventually ends up on a billboard or a book cover. But you can't make a picture by this man any better with technology because you cannot improve on genius. I could be biased as he's a personal favourite, but Vincent van Gogh has got to be one of the greatest painters of all time. And I'm sure there will be long queues for his latest exhibition in the Swiss city of Basel. An exhibition which includes many paintings rarely seen in public before. Basel's Kunstmuseum is hosting a comprehensive exhibition of works by the Dutch artist Vincent van Gogh until the end of September. The exhibition concentrates on the painter's landscapes. Van Gogh is frequently thought of in connection with madness and despair, and people often try to find evidence of this in his work. Art historian Stefan Kolderhoff has investigated the legend surrounding the misunderstood genius Van Gogh. We know that he sold 10 to 15 pictures during his lifetime, still not very many, but more than the one people talk about. We know he wanted success. He often argued with his brother, who he accused as an art dealer of doing too little to promote him. He wanted him to try harder and make him famous. 
70 landscapes from different stages in the painter's life show Van Gogh's artistic development. Many come from private collections and until now were mostly inaccessible to the public. So far, we've only known this picture in black and white, a really bad copy in the catalogue. It's the first time I've seen it in colour. Van Gogh only began painting his very familiar subjects in Provence, southern France, during the last three years of his life, starting in 1888. Wheat fields and landscapes flooded with southern European sunshine. He withdrew from city life in Paris and concentrated exclusively on rural scenes. In the south of France, he was a long way from the art market. There were no galleries or collectors. It's different today. Between 1907 and 1911 at the latest, the Paul Cassira Gallery began to organize major exhibitions, and from then on, his fame was assured. Anyone looking at Van Gogh's works today would find little cause for consternation. They are landscapes, and recognizably so representational paintings that appeal to people's feelings, nothing that's too complicated to understand. But for Van Gogh's contemporaries 120 years ago, this was radically new art. Which other painter of the time, 1889, when the Germans were painting in the naturalist manner, would have painted the sky in green, yellow, red, the clouds merely indicated with small strokes? Who would have dared to paint blue shadows on the ground? Olive trees, whose leaves were only one color, rendered in such a shimmering way. This is incredibly forward-looking, it's almost expressionist, and we can only guess what would have come next had he not died a year later. Van Gogh was only 37 when he died following a suicide attempt in southern France. That is common knowledge. The legend of his early death, unrecognized and alone, fires the imagination. Van Gogh's biography has been providing material for novels and films for years. He was by no means unknown during his lifetime. If, for example, you look at the letters of condolence that his family received after his death, they were from people like Claude Monet, Paul Signac. The most important art critics of the day expressed their sympathy. So in artistic circles, he certainly was esteemed. 500,000 people are expected to visit the exhibition in Basel. It's considered to be one of the major cultural highlights of 2009. Every two years here in Germany, there is a national horticultural show, for short, the Buga. It's funded by the government, and it's actually a rather clever way of giving cities around the country a bit of a facelift. It's much more than a flower show, as vast gardens are landscaped and become a permanent feature of the chosen city. This year, it was the turn of the northern city of Schwerin. We had an exclusive preview with the two landscape architects who planned it. Final preparations are underway in the 21st century garden. This is meant to be a glimpse into the future, but there are still many old friends on hand. Tulips, forget-me-nots and pansies, and all sorts of grasses. The garden was the brainchild of Hamburg landscape architects Henning Breimann and Bertel Bruin. Although they and their team have designed modern gardens and parks all over the world, the 21st century garden presented some difficulties. The original urban planning idea was for it to remain a venue for events at a later date with different sorts of grass. It was incredibly difficult. We started asking ourselves in 2002, when the 21st century had just begun, what would happen in 91 years? Would it still be a 21st century garden? It was really hard not to bow to current fashion. We were worried we'd come up with something original that would already be old hat in 2009. So they had to design something new for the area in front of the castle in the middle of Schwerin. What's emerged is an unusual structure, a floating meadow. Nearly as large as five soccer pitches, built on pilings that are rammed 28 meters down into the ground. The project cost 34 million euros. The lake behind the palace was deepened and almost doubled in size, bringing an area of water closer to the city center. 
In the past, when you entered the city from its best side, you didn't realize Schwerin is on seven lakes. The idea was to make the lakeside more a part of the city, to emphasize that this entire historical cityscape has this expanse of water. We know from other cities that have large lakes how great that can be. Especially when there's an island in the lake with an unobstructed view from all sides. It's a concept with a clear idea behind it. It's meant to appeal to young people, and in that sense, the future. What we've created is now a large event and park ground, an open meadow. Basically, we've answered the question about a 21st century garden with a stage. Because this stage will still work well in 91 years. Basically, this here is an experiment. The garden was always a place to experiment. They also experimented with large areas covered not with grass, but glass. 700,000 wine bottles were ground up. The blunted glass can withstand the feet of the expected 2 million visitors better than grass, and there are optical advantages. At sunrise and sunset there are reflections here. Then that sense of being on an island is much stronger. Children love the way it feels to walk on it. Everyone knows what it's like when you walk along the beach and there's a bed of mussels. Children love it because it crunches and cracks. That's the feeling you get here. Feelings the vegetation too is meant to evoke. Until the end of the horticultural show in October, the plants will present themselves in fresh and changing colors. How the people of Schwerin use the garden after that remains up to them. The planners have finished their work. After nearly six years of labor, they can now use the garden the way it's meant to be used and will be used in the future as a place to relax. The Salone del Mobile in Milan is said to be the largest trade fair of its kind in the world. So no better place to find out about the latest trends in furniture and interior design. And we enlisted the professional help of the editor-in-chief of one of Europe's top furniture magazines. The number one trend this year is simple elegance coupled with practical design, like this sideboard by Italian designer Porro. Or a modern interpretation of a classic Italian chair design, the Trattoria chair, developed by British star designer Jasper Morrison for the Italian furniture giant Magis. There are no huge opulent designs anymore. The furniture is reduced in shape, color and functionality. So the colors are not loud. They tend to blend in instead. Italian manufacturer Minotti has developed a whole collection in earthy colors, focusing on this idea of simple elegance. So the style that we would like to represent this year is a, 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 a relaxing style where you can find the, the atmosphere of your home but uh, in the same time in your private home you have to be able to receive people. Trend number two is about getting back to nature. Designers have interpreted this creatively. Take the flower table for example. It's made of plywood, and real flowers have been pressed into it using a special method. Another trend you can clearly see here is working in an environmentally friendly and sustainable way. The materials, especially the tendency to use wood, really show this trend. Entire pieces of furniture are being made of wood. Which takes us to trend number three, wood in all shapes and sizes. The Swiss furniture maker Rettlisberger has designed a unique closet made with woven wood. Wood emanates a naturalness that contrasts with our fast-paced lifestyle and modern forms. It's something people can go back to and feel at home with. A final exhibit combines two trends in one, simple elegance and natural materials. 
This is suede. It's not often used for furniture right now. It's really nice because suede has this natural used look, like a favorite handbag, meaning it's good when your own fingerprints are on it, traces that make it uniquely yours. Simple elegance, unique shapes in wood and natural materials are the trends in demand this year at the Salone del Mobile, as seen by home editor-in-chief Heidi Meyerhofer. Finally, a travel guide with a difference. They're published by the British magazine Wallpaper, which features interior design, fashion and all the latest trends. Their city guides are rather quirky. For instance, the guide to Paris doesn't bother to feature the Eiffel Tower. The idea is to go off the beaten track and find the real heart of each city. A new guide has just come out on Frankfurt and we met up with the author there. These days, travelers are spoilt for choice when it comes to guidebooks. No one would dream of going anywhere without one. But which one should they choose? It seems that the companion of choice for discerning travelers is Wallpaper City Guides. They're published by the London-based Wallpaper magazine and billed as the definitive guides for lifestyle-conscious tourists. With over a million copies sold worldwide, covering 80 cities, 42 have already been translated into German. The latest is a guide to Frankfurt, set to be launched in May. It's written by British journalist Guy Dittrich, who's been working for Wallpaper for six years, constantly on the lookout for exciting places off the beaten track. I think the Wallpaper City Guides really capture the zeitgeist of the city by getting a little bit behind the city, off the mainstream, um, things that are a bit more on trend, uh, and certainly it's the sort of things you'll see in the guides are, are not what you would normally expect uh, to see in a, in a normal mainstream guidebook. Um, the old historical monuments, etc., are probably not going to be covered in our, in our, uh, in our guides. Instead, they're more likely to cover fashionable hangouts, such as the Chalet Multi-Lounge, in Frankfurt's new West Harbour City District. It only opened a year ago. Guy Dittrich stumbled across the bar by chance and soon got to know its interior designer. When he's researching a new city, he's eager to soak up as much insider information as possible. One of the, the, the beauties of being an outsider uh, when you come to visit a city, although I know the cities obviously pretty well, uh, you look at them with fresh eyes uh, and you see things that the locals uh, perhaps don't see or they see every day but they never notice. The guide features 10 recommendations for restaurants, bars and clubs based first and foremost on their design. The wallpaper city guides raise travelers' awareness of contemporary architecture. So the Dresdner Bank's silver tower built in the 1970s gets a mention. As do the postmodern houses in the Saalgasse, which date back to the 1980s. None of the city's modern architecture landmarks are overlooked. The guide's other focus is shopping. Guy Dittrich has located Frankfurt's most cutting-edge stores, a far cry from the busy shopping precincts. He profiles the small and select stores with distinctive and stylish looks that set them apart. Like this one, which sells work by local artists and designers. It's all part of the wallpaper concept. The shops that we tend to look for are the, the ones that are different, the ones that are particular to a location. So every city is obviously different, uh, and we try and find the stores that really say something about the city, that celebrate the city, its life, and the people that work and live there. The wallpaper city guides also prefer hotels that have a bit of character. Guy Dittrich tries them out in person. Pure is near the city's main station and boasts great design.
The guides are updated every two to three years. Guide Dittrich is already planning his next itinerary. There are so many new places to discover, he can't wait to get going. Don't forget that if you want to see any of those reports again or others from Euromax, you'll find them on YouTube under Deutsche Welle English. That's it for now, though. Until next time. Bye-bye.